Luke chapter 15 uh, is what we're going to dive into. And this is, is quite possibly one of the most famous chapters in the entire Bible. I'm sure of that. And the reason is it, it's be, because of the stories that Jesus tells in the chapter. He tells three of them, three stories all in a row, a trilogy, if you will. And, and they have become famous even outside the church world. Uh, it, for example, if you talk about a prodigal uh, returning home, people know what that means even if they have no church background. They know what the prodigal son is about. And in Luke 15, Jesus, Jesus tells the parable of, of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and then and he tells the parable of the prodigal son, or we could even say the lost son. And, and he tells them one right after another, no transition points, no application points at the end. But here's the thing. The key to understanding Luke 15 is really in the first two verses. And if you read these parables as they stand without an understanding of who's in the crowd that day, then you will lose the weight of what's going on in this situation. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to really break down these first two verses because we lose the weight of these two verses due to historical and cultural differences. And so we're going to get into it. And I believe that God has something for us today. So let me show you what I mean about, about these first two verses. Look at Luke chapter 15, verse 1. It says this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Now that seems very straightforward to us, but we need to talk about what that, that really says. Because this is one of those verses that gets completely lost because of cultural differences. What ends up happening is, is, is that the real weight uh, and, the, and the hatred behind all of this gets lost uh, by us because here, here's what we've been told. And if you've been in church for a while, you, you've heard this. We've been told that a tax collector was someone who stole money from the Jews. Many of us, most of us at least, have, have heard that the, that the reason tax collectors like Zacchaeus were, were so despised was because they gathered taxes for Rome, for Rome and they would cheat their fellow Jews by collecting more money than the Romans required. And if you have any church background, that's, that's what you've been told, why tax collectors were so despised. And, and that is true. They did do that. But the reason they were hated goes well beyond simple thievery. At the time that Jesus was walking on the face of the earth, Israel was being ruled by Rome. In fact, Rome at this time ruled all the way from England to India. And so church, try to get your head, uh, uh, wrap your head around how massive of an empire that would have been from England all the way down to India. Massive land mass. And so, and, and although some movies, you know, they tried to make Rome out, to, they sort of glamorize it and make it, Make it look like it was this uh, amazing thing, you know. But in reality, what we need to know is that Rome was a ruthless empire that conquered the world by slaughtering hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. They would, the, and if you if you get outside of the the Christi Christianity in your world, and you begin to read just some history books, you'll discover just how ruthless and how cruel they really were. They would walk into a city, build a statue of Caesar, who was who was supposed to be God, which is kind of funny by itself because the problem with somebody declares himself to be a god is they keep dying. So that's that's neither here nor there though. But they would build a statue of Caesar, Caesar who was supposed to be God, and then they would say to the people in that city, bow down and worship. Now they didn't care if you worship your gods, but you had to worship Caesar first. And if you wouldn't worship Caesar, then they would just slaughter the town. There are historical accounts of cities having anywhere from 30 to 40,000 men, women, and children crucified outside the city. I mean, can we even wrap our brains around the idea of 40,000 men, women, and children being nailed to crosses or impaled on, on posts outside the city walls just to remind people of, of Roman power? They were, <clears throat> excuse me, they were ruthless, violent, unbelievably pagan men who ruled the world at this point. So now I want, I want to walk through <clears throat> what this means <clears throat> when, when we read this about these tax collectors because here's the problem. 
when you begin to realize Rome has this massive empire from England all the way to India, here's the problem. How do you police a landmass from England to India without quick strike ability? Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. See, we live in the modern world. In today's world, in, in the United States, let's just say that Arkansas decided that, uh, that we should be our own country. And sometimes it feels like our own country, doesn't it? Um, then, and we, we're going to be the Republic of Arkansas. Well, here's what we know historically is that seceding from the Union does not go well. So, so it's not going to go well for us. It's, but here's, here's the thing. It's not going to take two months for troops to march from Washington, D.C. by foot down to Arkansas, what they're going to do is they're going to make a phone call, push a button, they're going to send some troops by helicopters and by airplane, and they're going to have tanks down here, they're going to have all these things, and in a very short amount of time, all of the, all of the hooligans who, who think that we should be our own nation will be history. That's the way it's going to work. That's how it works in the modern world. In the first century, though, it just wasn't that easy. For Rome to rule this massive area from, uh, of their empire, they had to have a massive, massive, massive army because they had to have troops occupying all of that territory. Now here's the question. How do you fund a massive, massive Massive army. Bingo, taxes. These tax collectors that we, we read about here, they were, they were Jewish people, they were Jews who paid Rome for the right to gather taxes. So it wasn't just that they were charging extra and keeping the extra money, but at this time in history, we need to know, scholars tell us that up to 90% of household income went to taxes. How many of you realize that Taxes are bad here, but 90%, it would be as bad as it could get just about. But, but up to 90% uh, to of household income went to taxes, and a great deal of that money went to fund this massive Roman army. So now the Jews, they're a proud people. that they, they, they know, they believe that God has decreed that they would be a nation. And for them, in their mindset, for a Jewish man to purchase the right to tax the Jewish people in order to pay their, their oppressors who continue to oppress them, that was unforgivable. That was treason. It wasn't just thievery. It was a betrayal of your own people, of your own nation, of everything that, that Israel stands for. And you know, and the truth is there's no modern day equivalent where as an, where an American you know, I mean, I've thought about it. I can't think of anything that we could really relate to this, where an American would betray all of us and begin to gather money from us to pay for a foreign occupying force that was killing and torturing our wives and our husbands and our children. There, there's nothing in modern times in, in our westernized mind that can even really begin to comprehend this scenario. So now... Knowing that, knowing that this is beyond just simple thievery, that this is about treason, uh, let's just, why would, maybe, maybe, maybe we can understand why the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled when Jesus walked through them and, they, and he walked straight up to the sycamore tree and said to Zacchaeus, this tax collector, hey, come on down, I'm coming to your house. Maybe now we understand their outrage. Do you, do you understand why they gasped, gasped at this? Do you, do you, can you see why they were enraged at this? Can you, can you imagine the, the man in the crowd there in Jericho who had, who had seen his sister and her family slaughtered by Rome? And that man knew that that occurred because this man was raising funds for the army. Now do you understand why the crowd is furious with Jesus when he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. This goes well beyond money. This goes well beyond you took more money from me than you should have. It's a, it's a treasonous act. So the first group that's there are tax collectors. But there's a second group mentioned. It says they're tax collectors and sinners. The second group there that's there are sinners. Now, once again, what happens to you and me is that because uh, we don't understand the cultural context of the time, we miss out on what this really means. Because when we think of the word sinners, what do we think of? We think of everybody, 
right? Because we know the New Testament teaches that we have all sinned, and that's true. But what we need to understand is that in first century Israel, the term sinner did not refer to everyone. That's not how they thought about it. Sinners, in their mind, was a class of people. You know, in the United States, there is no, no class system. You know, we just, we, the closest we got is tax brackets. But there's no system of classes where uh, a guy who is born poor will always be poor. So it's hard for us to get this in our mind. In, in India, I, I, think they, I think they've outlawed it, but it's still somewhat there. But they, for, historically, they've, they've had a caste system, which, which means that if you were born a beggar, you're a beggar. The rest of your life. I mean, there's no college, no high school, n- nothing. They're, you're done. You're a beggar. And, and that's why when two beggars would have a child, and if that child was born healthy and whole, they, will, they would often maim that child. They will do something to the baby to deform it some way or another because being deformed, it would make that child a more effective beggar. It's about, it's about survival. So a sinner in first century Israel was a class of people, especially referring to those who had jobs that were considered questionable or immoral. Slave traders, prostitutes, etc. This this was a group of people that by virtue of what they did, they were considered unclean and alienated from God. But on top of that, not only were sinners uh, considered uh, the people who did questionable things or, or lived immoral ways, but also, in their minds, sinners were people with deformities. People that, with deformities that they were born with or, or they, they got some sort of disease and had some sort of accident that, that kept them out of society. For example, you know, somebody who contracted leprosy, they would be considered a sinner because for some reason this happened to them is what their mindset was. That's, that's why the disciples, you remember when, the, when the, they were, the disciples and Jesus were walking past a man born blind? And the disciples ask a really interesting question because they said, Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was, it, was he born blind because of his own sin or because of his parents' sin? That was the only two options. In their mind, the only reason a person would be born blind was because of sin. It had to be sin. And that's why they were considered in this. And a, a, a person was considered a sinner, not because necessarily because of action, but rather because he or she couldn't walk or, or she was, they were missing a limb or they're blind or deaf or something like that. So, so sinners were a class of people that were defined by either immorality or deformity. All right, now knowing those two things, let's go back and read that verse again. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners... We're all doing what? All drawing near to hear him. These traitors, these immoral people, these people who are the outcasts of society because of their own deformities, all pushing in close because they want to hear what Jesus is saying. I love that. Because when the, when the true gospel is preached, where, where the true gospel is, Even tax collectors will push in close to here. But you know what? Tax collectors and sinners weren't the only ones that were in the crowd that day. There were others in the crowd. Look at verse 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Here's what's happening. In first century Judaism, tax collectors and sinners they would not have been allowed anywhere near the temple. They're not getting in the temple. They can't do this. They were, they were, according to the religious rulers of the day, they were alienated from God, and they had no chance whatsoever of being taught the Scriptures or hearing them read. None. No chance. And Jesus not only receives them, but He eats with them. So the Pharisees and the scribes in the crowd begin to grumble. And in their grumbling, they make an accusation against Jesus. And they say, basically they're saying, since Jesus receives sinners and he eats with them, then Jesus himself 
is lawless and he is unclean. They're, they're claiming that Jesus is alienated from God, which is, kind of makes me chuckle since he is God. Uh, but, but they say he's alienated from God because of those with whom he associates. Therefore, their point was, you don't have to listen to him and you don't have to do what he says. You don't have to obey him. So Jesus, hearing them make this accusation, responds with three parables, three stories. And by the time he's through with these three stories, you will completely understand why they wanted him dead. Here we go. Luke chapter 15, verse 3. Here's the first story. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does, does not leave the 99 in open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? So, so here's what he's doing. The Pharisees and the scribes believed that the heart of God was separation and ritual purity. Come out from among them and be ye, be ye separate. Uh, and their, their mind was, we are supposed to be separated from these people. We're supposed to be ritually pure. That was that what they believed, what the heart of God was all about. They were willing to let anybody else who was outside of ritual purity go by the wayside. And Jesus is basically saying to them, shame on you. Who would, who would, who would just let a, a sheep die? Who would let the lamb die? And these Pharisees, they would have nothing to do with these people for fear of becoming unclean themselves. And so Jesus steps in and, and, and with a story that, that everybody there could understand, everybody could comprehend, he says to them, he says, God's ultimate goal is not just ritual purity, it's not just separatism, but his goal is finding what is lost. He leaves the 99 and pursues the one. And the Pharisees would say, well, you know, that one, that one is just foolish and whatever they get, they deserve. They, they should have stayed inside the fence. They should have, should have just done what they were supposed to do. It's their own fault if, they, if they're out there on their own. They would not have pursued the one. But, but Jesus says, no, 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 no. God is a pursuer of all of those people who wake up one day and say, how did I get here? What happened? Where am I? Can I ever, ever get home? And look how he finishes the story in verses 5 and 6. And when he has found it, found that sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So according to Jesus, God's goal is not separatism, it's not ritual purity, but the finding of of what was lost. That's God's goal. And then we know when he finds it and he saves it and he brings it home, there is a massive, massive celebration. Now, if you under, want to understand why the religious leaders absolutely hated Jesus, you need to look at verse 7. Because this is what he says. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He's saying, listen, God is more pleased. He is happier over. He celebrates the one person who comes to me, comes back home, the, the prodigal who comes home, the lost sheep who is found. He says, there's more joy over that than you being ritually pure. This is what he's saying to them. And he said it in front of all of them that if one of these tax collectors repents, that God will rejoice more in that man's repentance than in all of their ritual purity. And that absolutely infuriates them because that repudiates everything that they stand for and all of the pride, the, the religious pride that they have. They cannot believe that God would be happier with one of those people than he is with them. Then Jesus just starts the next story. No transition, no nothing, no explanation. He just starts the next story. Here we go, verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house 
and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Now the picture we get here is of a woman who is absolutely freaking out over this coin that has been lost. Now the coin that she lost is worth about what we know historically is was worth about one day's wage, which is a fair amount of money, but it's nothing to rip your house up over, right? It's a good amount of money, but it's not like you lost your life savings. This is not some catastrophic deal that's going to put her out on the street because she still has, out of ten, she's still got nine days' wages left. She loses one coin, and what does she do in response to losing just the one coin that seems pretty meaningless compared to all of the other nine? What she does is she does everything, whatever she can, to find the coin. She lights a lamp. She grabs a broom and starts sweeping up the floor. She starts searching. She, she takes the couch out uh, and puts it out in the front yard and goes through all the cushions there. She takes everything out of the attic. She, has a, she cleans out the garage and has a garage sale. And when she does all of these things and she finally finds the coin, she gathers all of her friends together and celebrates. And look what he says next. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, I just, the side note here, I love that verse because that verse, while I know the angels do rejoice, that, by, that verse does not say the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents. It says there is joy uh, before the angels of God. Who stands before the angels of God? The Father. God himself is the one that's rejoicing. God is the one who celebrates. The angels are following his lead when a sinner repents. God is the one who's up, up in heaven, jumping up and down, so to speak, and having a, a party over one sinner who comes home in repentance. Can, can, can you see that the religious leaders were, were not interested at all in the repentance of sinners? That was not their goal. That's not what mattered to them at all. They, 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 their thought, their idea was that they have alienated themselves. They'll just they'll get what they deserve, but we are ritualistically pure we are upright before God we have done all that is right they have failed so God judge them and God looks at them and he says judge them I'm I'm seeking them I'm trying to find them I'm trying to bring them home and then once again no transition point no explanation he just goes into a third story now, this third story is lengthier, and it's more detailed, specifically about the despair of lostness. Look at verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Now, some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about here, and some of you will, may just have to just trust me. But I want you to know, following Jesus can, at times, be very, very difficult because Jesus will make you confront what is wicked inside of you. Where, where we would rather numb ourselves to the reality of the self-destructive tendencies inside of us, Jesus will force the issue. When we're dealing with idolatry in our heart and we go to pray about anything else, the Bible in the Old Testament tells us that in that moment, God says, wait, 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 I'm not going to talk about those things first. Let's talk about the idols in your heart. When I'm dealing with, uh, with hatred or bitterness or anger or unforgiveness in my heart and I, and, and I go to God and I say, Lord, I want this and this and this, He is going to deal with me. He's going to push against those places and say, all right, listen, those are important, but let's talk about this. And, and we would rather numb ourselves and rather than deal with that. And when you stare at your wickedness in, the, in, in that process and then you decide to run from God instead of letting Jesus deal with your wickedness, here, I want you to hear this. Look at me and hear this. When you run from God instead of dealing with it, it will always feel like freedom at first. 
when this man, this prodigal son, when he goes to the far off land and squanders his wealth on parties and prostitutes, do you think he's missing his father's house at all? No, not at all. He's free from his father's rules, free from his father's land, free from his father's way of life. He is having the time of his life. He's doing whatever he wants to do. It feels like freedom to him. When we begin to confront our sins, whether they're, they're, they're sins of lust or anger or alcoholism or whatever it is that you deal with in your life, there will be a moment where it's, it just feels easier to run. Now, you may do that by running away from church and running away from God, or some of us who, are, who have gotten really good at it in the church, we, we run away from God by not dealing with it, but we, we just compartmentalize our lives and we, and we push them off to the edges, and, then, and we're still running from God. And it, and it will always, when we run from God, it will always feel like freedom for a little while. For a little while. But look what happens next, verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs, which is just unbelievable for a Jewish boy to be in the bacon preparation business. Verse 16, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that, pig, that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Have any of you ever, ever been around pigs? Have any of you seen what pigs eat? Have any of you smelled what pigs eat? Have you smelled pigs, for crying out loud? Oh, my goodness. I'll take a, a, a feedlot full of cattle any day. And if you've never smelled both, then good on you. That's all I can say. Can you imagine, if you've ever smelled that, if you've ever seen what they eat, hey, can you imagine being so hungry that you're looking at the slop, that the garbage, the rotting mess that the pigs are eating, and you're saying, mm, 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 boy, I wish I had some of that. Can you imagine? Now listen, here's what we need to understand. To refuse sonship to God absolutely guarantees slavery to something else. To refuse sonship to God absolutely guarantees slavery to something else. This man refused to be a son. He said, I want my inheritance. I don't want to be part of this household. I'm out of here. I don't want to be your son anymore. And in the end, he finds himself a slave feeding pigs. The crazy thing about it for us today is what we decide to be a slave to. Like, for example, I, I like sports, but there are a lot of men who know the entire roster of their favorite team. They know every stat of every player. They know where that guy went to college, where he played his high school ball, how many yards he rushed uh, for as a 15-year-old JV athlete. They know what next year looks like. They know what the schedule is, holds for their team the next year. They can break down stats and statistics, but then in the very same breath, they will look at you and say to you how crazy busy they are. They're too busy to intentionally love their wives, too busy to, to unpack the love of Christ to their children, too busy to really get in the Word, too busy for this, too busy for that. And let me tell you, if that's you, you are the slave to the activities of 18 to 24-year-old boys. And I like sports. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoy sports. In the same way, I've met m men and women who completely sell their soul to their boss or to their career. They're unhappy and frustrated with life, and they have no time for their family. They have no time to invest in their children. They, they have no time for anything that really matters, but they're making a lot of money. That's, that's slavery, man. You've decided with your 60 years to forsake all that does matter for all that doesn't. That's slavery. People who refuse sonship become slaves. It's, it's unavoidable. It'll be drugs and alcohol, or maybe your career, or it might be sports, or maybe music. It could be any, any number of things, but in the end, it will be something that is absolutely ridiculous compared to Jesus. You cannot say no to sonship and not walk into slavery. It's just the truth. If there was a way around it, I, listen, I, when I was younger especially, I tried to find it. 
It just, it's just not there. I've tried. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, love that verse. And I, I like some versions, they say when he came to his senses. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. I, I love a guy who plans out what he's going to say and practices it before he ever gets there. He's got a plan. He's going to go home. He's got the speech all planned out. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, he starts his speech. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father interrupts him. The father does not even acknowledge the statement. He doesn't even look at him and say, you know, you're right. That was pretty stupid, but come on in anyway. He doesn't do that. Look at his response. But the father said to me, interrupt him in the middle of his speech and the father said to his servants quickly bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate now, I want you to think about this. You've got to understand. Think about these stories in the context of whom, who, who is in the crowd, the people to whom he is speaking. Now, what do you think is happening in that crowd of tax collectors and prostitutes and slave traders and strippers or whatever and those that are maimed and sick and separated from society? They're hearing this story. See, in other stories... It was a coin. It was a sheep. I mean, just like children's stories. But now, it was a man who had wasted what had been given to him. What do you think is going through their mind in that moment? I mean, follow me here. These are Jews hearing this. They're God's chosen people. And they took what God had given to them and they ran with it. They ran away. And now they hear Jesus speaking and he's speaking to the Pharisees, but the, the tax collectors and sinners are hearing this, and Jesus is saying to them, if you come home, the Father will embrace you. And if the story stopped there, it, it'd, be, it'd be great already. But it, but it keeps going, and what happens next is, frankly, it's just really, really pathetic. I'll let, let's look at it. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him. So we'll stop there. The son, the older son, he's out in the field. He's coming in from a long, hard day at work. And he hears music, he says he hears the sound of dancing. I'm not sure exactly what the sound of dancing is, but he hears that. He hears the sound of celebration and he, and he calls a servant and asks him because, because those that are, that are uh, you know, religiously proud, they don't want to actually talk to the father. But anyway, he calls a servant over and he says, hey, what's going on here? What's, what's going on? I don't get this. I've seen my father these last several months, these, over this time since my brother left, and he has been in such sorrow, such sadness. What's the deal? Why in the world are we having a party all of a sudden? And they tell him what happened. And he is absolutely infuriated. He starts pouting outside and refuses to go in. The father does, he goes out to him, but you know what, it, what he doesn't do? The father doesn't go to him and say, if you don't get in that house and get in that house right now, I am going to snatch the life right out of you. You know, it's not what he does. Scripture says that the father begged and pleaded with him. And listen, is that not what Jesus is currently doing in this story? See, this story is, 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 is for the Pharisees and the scribes to be able to see you're the older brother. 
And Jesus, in this moment, he is currently pleading with these Pharisees. He's pleading with the older brother, and, and, and he's, he's telling them, listen, don't be like this. Look what the older brother says, verse 28 again. He says, but he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. I read that and I'm like, what? What? I mean, listen, inside the house, there is a monstrous celebration going on with, with steak on the grill and wine and all kinds of wonderful things. But the older brother stands out there and says, you never gave me a goat. I'd be like, did, did you say a goat? I mean, the music's kind of loud. I think I might have misheard you. Did you say a goat? If you said boat, maybe I'd understand. But did you say a goat? And he says, in the other room, there's, there's a celebration with the, with the best food and the best wine and the best musicians. And, and, and you want a goat so that you and your buddies can celebrate the fact that you just worked in the fields like I commanded? Are you serious? You want a goat? Inside... There is the best of everything he could ever want. He wants a goat. Inside there's the best of everything. The greatest adventure. The, the, the greatest of passions. The greatest of wine. The greatest of food. The greatest of music. The greatest of dancing. Inside the house, all of this awaits. And he wants a goat. Let's keep going. Verse 30. But when the son of yours came. Notice he doesn't say when my brother came. He's disowned him. He doesn't want anything to do with him. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, the father said to the older son, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. How big is that? See, the... This, the younger son already had his inheritance. It's gone. Everything that's left belongs to that older brother. Everything. He says, I'm with you always, son. You've always got me. I'm always going to love you. You don't have to worry about that. And, and by the way, everything I have is yours. You don't have to ask for a goat. It's all yours anyway. They, they filled, killed the fatted calf, but, but that was already the brother's calf. The wine that they were drinking from the vineyards, that, that was from vineyards that the older brother already owned. Let's keep going. Verse 31. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother. He's reminding him. See, he, the, the brother said, your son. And he's trying to remind him, no, it's not just my son. This is your brother. This is your brother. Remember in the Old Testament when, when the question was asked, am I my brother's keeper? The truth is, the answer to that question was, yes. Yes, we are. And he says, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad because this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And I'm hoping that today you begin to understand the gospel. Understand the gospels. Do you want to know why the woman walks into the room and, he, and she falls at the feet of Jesus and she begins to weep and as the tears fall on the feet of Jesus, she takes her hair and she washes his feet with her hair? Do you, know, do you want to know why she does that? It's because up until this point in her life, she's been alienated from God. She's been rejected by the religious people. She has no hope of salvation, no hope of restoration, no hope of redemption. And yet here is Jesus saying, the prodigal is why I came. You know why the woman breaks open the, the, the bottle of perfume and pours it on Jesus before his death do you understand why tax collectors like Zacchaeus were pressing in to hear him? Because he's giving them a message of hope that they've never had before. 
you don't understand why the religious elite were so infuriated with him, here it is, Luke 15. He's saying to them, this epic celebration, this party, this thing that I'm doing and sitting with and eating with tax collectors and sinners, that's all a precursor of what is to come. I'm showing you an example of what the gospel is. And he's telling to the older brothers, he's saying, now why don't you come? Why don't you come into the feast? Why don't you eat at this table along with? with us. He's saying that God is more pleased when sinners come back to him than when we do church well. I'm going to say that again. God is more pleased when sinners come back to him than we do church than when we do church well, when we obey our list, when we walk in our legalism. Now listen, I think yeah, how many of you know, you remember the old kid song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man? You know, cute song. But I think the problem with it is, is, is that when we see Zacchaeus as a wee little man, it sort of makes us feel sorry for him. But we need to know that he was a wicked, evil, horrible man who saw his own people slaughtered and he got rich off of it. Let's not make him pretty because Zacchaeus is not pretty. That's why it was such a miracle when he repented. He deserved to die as a traitor. But he found life instead. But Jesus goes to him and he says, let's go to your house, Zacchaeus. Let's sit down. Let's have a meal. Let's eat together. Let's talk. I want to have a relationship with you. Why? Why? Because today the gospel is unleashed on the world. And he says, I am pursuing what was lost. He says, I'm taking out the furniture. I'm lighting lamps. I'm sweeping floors. I'm leaving the 99, the Jews. I'm finding my sheep. I'm finding my coin. I'm finding my prodigal ones. And so today, it's hard to know how to make application. Because Jesus doesn't even really make application. But here's what I hope for us today. My hope for us today is I just, I just want you to see Jesus. I want you to see him today. The, the, the way people see Jesus determines the outworking of Jesus in their lives. The way we see him shapes how we see other people and, 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 and even how we look at church. So, so here, here's what I mean. If, if we see Jesus as the master of morality who demands perfection, then we will pursue moral and ritual purity and expect everyone else to do otherwise. And in so doing, you become the older brother. And if you see Jesus as someone who, who sees dirty people and clean people or wicked people and, and righteous people, and if you see Jesus as someone who sees the division as us and them, then that's how you will see people. But I just want you to see him for who he is. That we would see him as the one who says, I thank God for the 99 but I'm not about to forsake the one. That, that, the, that my father is going to rejoice when the one comes home. So if, if you would just not just do church today, but if you would just let this sink into your heart that this is who Jesus is. He engages with love and mercy and hope the most wicked and most deplorable human beings that you could imagine. He engages a class of people that everyone would say, I don't want them anywhere near me. I don't want them anywhere near my family. So you got to understand when these people gathered and press in to hear Jesus speak, you got to understand that, that many of these people, like the lepers and some of the people that were, that were considered sinners and immoral, they would come in and they were a mass of people that, that you would, if you would had your kids, you'd say, oh, no, I don't think I'm worried. We're not going to go over there. I'm hoping maybe that you just see him for who he really is. And then I'm hoping that by seeing him, we'll begin to see that Jesus loves the prodigal. 
Jesus loves the one who's wandered away. Jesus loves the one who has rebelled. He doesn't hate them. He's not angry with the prodigal. He actually yearns for the prodigal to come home. He yearns with love. He yearns with hope. And my hope is that these truths would collide with our heart and would change the way we see the church, that would change the way that we live our lives, that would change the way we see our neighbors, it would change the way we feel when other people fall into sin, or maybe even change the way we feel about ourselves when we fall into sin. And I, my prayer is that with our 40 years, because you know I feel like every generation gets about, a, about 40 years, 40 year window. You know, maybe I'm... I'm, I'm nearing the end of my 40-year window, but some of you are the early stages of yours. My prayer is that with our 40 years here, we might be lamps, that we might be bristles in the broom, that we might move couches, because I think if you don't, you have no hope but to become the older brother. That we will be people who seek the lost. So may we seeing and savoring Jesus, have the Holy Spirit work in us so that, so that through the work of the Holy Spirit, so that sheep may be found, that, so that coins may be gathered, so that the prodigal would be welcomed home. And that we would be the older brother that runs into the party instead of sitting outside him. Would you bow your head? Let's pray together. Father, Thank you so much for these men and women. I thank you, God, for a chance today to just open up the scriptures and look at what you say and pray and seek your face. God, first today, I just I pray for the prodigals. Prodigals in this room, prodigals on the live stream, prodigals, Lord God, that, that are far from the church. And at this point in time, it's hard for us to even imagine that they'll ever come back into the doors of a church. But I pray, God, for that prodigal who at one time ran away thinking it felt like freedom only to find themselves enslaved. Enslaved to some, some perversion, some addiction, some impulse. And they're looking at their, their lives and saying, how did I get here? What happened? How did I end up like this? I pray, God, that you would Draw them home. I pray that they would hear today, they would hear your love for them, that they would realize that you're not standing there condemning them, but you're beckoning, beckoning them to come home, that you're like the father of the prodigal son, that as he waited, he was watching for his son to come. And as soon as he showed up, as soon as his son made that first step, he ran and embraced him. And Lord, I pray you'd help the prodigal to know that you're ready to embrace, that that's what you want to do. You want to bring them home. You want to clean them up. You want to put clean clothes on them. You want to make them your child. You, you want to, to be able to forgive and wash it all away and give them a brand new, fresh start. God, I also pray for men and women who are right now thinking about running. They haven't become a prodigal yet, but they're just really struggling and they're thinking about running from you because they've been battling things and they can't figure out how to defeat it and they, can't, don't, they don't know what to do. And I pray, God, that in Jesus' name you'd fill them with hope. Help them to see, Jesus, that you, even though at, at times it may take a lifetime, but you will see them through. God, I pray for lost sheep. I pray for lost coins and I pray for lost sons, but I also pray for the older brothers. Help us not to be people who set ourselves up on a pedestal and take pride in our own religious purity or our own religious pride. Help us not to become people like that, God. Help us to remember that every one of us, at one time or another, we're serving slop to pigs. We were enslaved to something. You set us free. We're no different. We're no better. The only difference is that we've found grace and they haven't. So God, I pray that you would make us the older brother that, 
that doesn't sit outside and pout and get jealous because somebody else is getting attention, but Lord, that we would be the older brother and rejoices and says, my brother is home, my brother is home, my brother is home. Help us, God, to be those people. Help us, God, to be the people who will become a, a, a lamp that's been lit, a, a broom in your hand, sweeping to find those that are lost, the people that are moving furniture around, people that are searching for the lost sheep and then helping to carry them home. Help us to become those people, God. And I know that that's for most of us, that's our heart, but God, help us to see how we can do that in very real and practical ways, whether it's by phone calls or conversations or cards that are sent or, or, or certainly not, not least, but our prayers and our intercession for them. God, just help us to be a church that's all about lost and found. Help us to be the older brothers who rejoice. And we pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't know where anybody is. See, the thing is, I'm pretty easy to fool. I'm kind of one of those people that tends to look on the bright side. I see the I assume the best about people. At least I try to. So I'm pretty easy to fool. You can trick me. You can, you can say the right words. And, and I'll believe that everything's good inside. But it just doesn't work with God, does it? Maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor Dave, I want you to pray for me. I, I've been running. I'm a prodigal. Maybe you're still attending church, but you've been running from God. You've been running from what He's saying to you. Or maybe... You're a person that's just thinking about running. But if that's you today, and you'd say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Yes, yes. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Maybe online. You can just put in the comments, say, please pray for me. It's a powerful, powerful thing to humble yourself before God and say, Lord, I'm tired of trying it my way. I just ended up with, in, the, in the pen with the pigs, offering slop. So God, I'm ready to turn my life over to you. I'm ready to come home. If that's you, would you just pray a simple prayer with me? And, and there's nothing special about the words, but this is about the sincerity of your heart. If you mean this, this is a powerful moment for you. But everybody just, just pray this prayer with me. Would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I've been running and it's not working. I'm in trouble. I, I'm, I'm far from you. I've made a mess of things. My life is broken. Even if, some, if other people can't see it, my life is broken. I want to come home. I want to be the prodigal that runs home. So I give myself to you. I surrender to you. And I ask you to bring freedom to my life. Help me to stand with you. To walk with you. To do what you say. And keep me from running, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, that's a simple prayer that anybody can pray at any time. And when you pray that, the good news is that was the prodigal starting on the journey home and the father from the very first, before you even spoke the very first word, was running to embrace you. And I believe his message to you today is very simple. Welcome home. Welcome home. Amen. Would you put your hands together and give God praise this morning?